Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this one we'll be taking a look at a low profile mini ITX based system from the early 2000s. We'll open it up, take a look at its internals before putting it through its paces with some Windows 98 and MS-DOS games and benchmarks. I'll be using stock and overclock configurations to see how much performance we can squeeze out of this little PC. Starting with the front, there's not much to see here, just a plain black box with a couple of buttons and a small panel containing USB, Firewire and audio ports. Turning around to the rear, we can see an ATX standard rear panel I.O., what looks to be like an expansion card slot on its side, and a few spots where fans could go. This system is close to the reference system VIA Technologies pitched when it launched the Mini ITX form factor in 2001. VIA pitched these information systems to be cheap set-top boxes or embedded multimedia solutions. One such manufacturer of these chassis is fellow Taiwanese manufacturer Morex. If you've ever searched for a generic Mini ITX or small footprint case, you've probably seen some of their handiwork. Taking a look on the inside now, we get to see what makes this tick. We can see a passively cooled Mini ITX motherboard and a PCI riser card, with a DC power supply and a 3.5 inch hard drive bay that's currently got nothing in it. The motherboard we're looking at today is the EPIA-ML6000EA from VIA circa 2005. VIA tended to use designations in their part numbers, for this example the EA designates fanless cooling E and without TV output A. This is a fairly late incarnation of the EPIA-ML motherboard. VIA started selling these in late 2003 and kept going with it in various configurations until 2006. It is a highly integrated mini ITX board with embedded Eden ESP6000 CPU, one SD RAM socket that can take up to 1GB of DDR266, two Ultra DMA133 capable IDE connectors, the CLE266 North Bridge with integrated Unichrome AGP graphics, AC97 Sound, which unfortunately only works under Windows, 10100 Ethernet, one PCI slot which can accept a riser card or cable supporting up to two PCI devices simultaneously. Using the onboard connectors and headers in this motherboard, we can get an additional two USB 2.0 ports, a CD audio in connector, additional serial port, and front panel audio. A little bit about this Eden CPU. Some of you might not have heard of it before, might not know what it is. It was developed and designed by VIA as an offshoot to their C3 processor line. VIA was one of the few companies that had the rights to develop and manufacture x86 compatible CPUs alongside AMD and Intel. It acquired these rights through purchasing former technology companies Cyrix and Centaur in 1999. As a side note, they also purchased S3 graphics a year later, but we'll talk about that one in a little while. VIA knew they couldn't compete with Intel and AMD on raw compute and decided to aim this newly acquired IP to focus on low power, low cost, specialized embedded markets. In early 2000, using the Cyrix IP for its KN and Gobi core, VIA had spun this into what became the Cyrix 3 Joshua core. Unfortunately, it didn't meet the brief on power consumption and clock scaling. It also wasn't released to the market, despite being well sampled to reviewers at the time. Centaur had been working on their C5 series of cores as a continuation of its Winchip line of CPUs. These were renowned for being simple in design, scalable, good on power consumption and thermals. VIA opted to switch team have Centaur kick off the Samuel core for Socket 370 later in year 2000. Its release to the market gave some confusion at the time. Being named Cyrix 3 and released with a Centaur core and seemingly lower specs than the Cantual Joshua core, including a half-speed floating point unit, but it proved to be a fortunate choice in the long run. Samuel hit the KPIs VIA had in place at the time, it was efficient and the clock scaled well. TDP was varied from about 7 to 17 watts, as opposed to the 24 that they were getting before, and some of the earlier models could operate passively cooled. A year later, Samuel 2 was released, and this is where things really started to move for VIA. They dropped the Cyrix 3 naming for the Socket 370 CPUs, and went all in with the C3 branding instead. Later in 2001, VIA put out the ITX and Mini ITX reference boards featuring the Samuel 2 based C3800 embedded in its early EPIA series of motherboards. It was also spun into the lower TDP and passively cooled Eden and released as an option alongside the fan called C3. Shortly after this, VIA did some refinements to the Samuel 2 core and moved to a smaller process. These were only relevant to the Socket 370 and its newly introduced laptop EBGA line. This core was referred to as Ezra and Ezra T. Then in 2003, there was a jump to the Nehemiah core, which brought with it an increase to L1 cache and the introduction of Intel's SSE and VIA's new padlock extensions. Nano ITX standard was being introduced along at this time and brought with it the Nano BGA implementation. On the topic of CPUs, 
This EPI ML motherboard has got an Eden ESP6000 CPU. With its 6 watt TDP, it is a small passively cooled CPU that was targeted towards low power applications and multimedia solutions. This particular CPU is one of the later models, stamped with a June 2005 date code. It contains the 130nm Nehemiah core from 2003. While researching my exact chip, I fell down a rabbit hole of white papers and confusing spec sheets. The BIOS referred to it as a 667 MHz mobile C3, but various documentation showed Eden ESP6000, which was supposed to be 500 MHz. There is an explanation to this. When Eden was introduced in December 2001, it launched with four models, ranging from 300 to 600 MHz, with the top model being the ESP6000, based on the 150 nm Samuel II core. A few years later, VIA released a chip also called the ESP6000, but this time without the space. It's a completely different beast, with a newer core, a full speed floating point unit, lower voltage, and a 10% clock speed increase. For all intents and purposes, both are ESP6000 chips, and are only separated by internal model numbers. One interesting thing which probably didn't impact too many people at the time was the drop of 3D Now instructions from the previous model in favour for Intel SSE and VIA's new padlock suite of extensions. Ok, with the backstory out of the way, it's time to get this build done and boot it up. It's pretty straightforward with these mini ITX boards. You only get one stick of RAM, and for this build I'm using a 512MB DDR400 stick, which is a bit of overkill, but I don't have anything smaller or slower. The CLE266 will only run this memory at DDR266 anyway, but that's ok. For storage, we have an IDE interface, and I'll be using this interestingly branded 64GB SSD I got off AliExpress and hook it up to a generic SATA to IDE adapter. I also printed up this little bracket to make it fit within the 3.5 inch bay and position itself so the adapter doesn't fail on the case. The operating system setup will be Windows 98 and MS-DOS. This board is targeted towards Windows XP and while I believe the drivers are a bit more mature, especially with the video, I am targeting older games and would like some real mode DOS support as well. This brings us to sound card choices. While we have an onboard via AC97 codec, it doesn't support DOS nor does it work with something like the SBEMU project. I've had a pretty good run with the ESS Solo 1 based PCI sound cards, and I reckon it's a pretty good fit for this project. Getting it installed isn't the easiest thing in this case. You need to remove that bracket and slide the card in through the slot. It also limits the type of cards you can install, unfortunately. Now it's time to see this little PC do what it does. I'm using the latest BIOS I could find, which is 1.04, released in August 2005. We can see our Eden is being referenced as a C3667A, which isn't accurate. Booting into the Windows 98 desktop, we get a big chunky image. Apologies, I'm capturing this through my scaler at 480p. We start out looking at hardware info to check out some of the detected hardware and configurations. The developer still supports Windows 98 and MS-DOS, which is really helpful for us retro guys. We see with the CPU, it detects the stepping as 8 and finds the Nehemiah core. Interestingly, the CPU base is listed as 1.2 GHz, as opposed to the 666MHz current base. This leads me to believe VIA didn't do too much when spinning the C3 down to the Eden. It looks like there's some selective binning, an undervolt, and a downclock to achieve the low TDP. We can see our motherboard is detected here, along with the chipset information. 512MB of DDR266 RAM is being detected, and the sound card is being detected here on IRQ5, which is very helpful for DOS gaming later. The video adapter is being detected as a VIA-S3 Castle Rock. Also known as CLE266 IGP or Unichrome IGP, this solution is a mixture of technologies from the S3 IP acquisition that forms a 2D 3D package. Let's see how this performs in some games. Starting out with GL Quake, we get some OK frame rates here, but we need to drop down to 384p to get a reliable 60 frames per second. Quake 2 is a bit more of an experiment. I lower the texture quality down one notch to get these scores. If I stuck with a normal quality setting, we got quite a lot of drops under 30 frames. Quake 3 on the other hand was very choppy at the 480p normal setting. I know it only looks like 2 frames, but I found the consistency at 384p fastest to be a lot better. 
Motor Racer fared a bit better here, averaging 44 frames per second for the single lap run. I did find it a bit choppy at times, and I didn't expect that given this game is quite old and is only running at 480p. <laughs> Forsaken runs well, but has a few dips here and there, particularly when the action's heavy. Incoming had an okay result here. Notable is the dodgy sky texture. This is something that appears common with the Unichrome, and I've seen it on multiple builds. The frame rate seems solid, but this is an older title, so you'd expect as much. Expandable doesn't fare too well on this setup. It's probably still playable, but it doesn't look like a lot of fun in this frame rate. Finally, the synthetics. I didn't bother with a big suite, just 3D Mark 2001 SE, where we get a total score of 547. I've been chucking in the CPU-Z Vintage Edition CPU benchmarks, along with my regular recordings. Compared to the 1GHz Eden reference in VE, the 667 MHz model seems to be about 58% slower. It is possible the reference one is a newer core, like Esther, or Isaiah. Floating point is very weak, only marginally above an MMX200 score of 1168. Yikes. To be fair, Viot was open about this at the time, it certainly wasn't one of its priorities, and it shows. Okay, so let's see if we can squeeze a bit more performance out of this setup. Using Power Strip, we can bump the core to 160 MHz. Unfortunately, I have to do this a funny way where I save the profile and I apply it outside of the UI. If I apply it with inside the UI, I get a crash. Just one of the many quirks of this setup. Using CPU speed, we can overclock the Eden to 8.5 times or 1.13 GHz. This is almost double the base. This is still without any fan or any change to cooling. Running through the same benchmarks again and we see some nice uplifts across the board. GL Quake stays above 60 frames even at 480p. Quake 2 and 3 both get decent increases too although I'd still probably stick to 384p for these. Motor Racer was hitting the V-Sync ceiling a bit more and was smoother all around, a nice increase here. Incoming had some small but okay gains as well. Expendable is now playable with an average of 30 frames a second. It's still not fantastic, but it's significantly better than a stock config. Synthetics seem to benefit greatly from the overclock. 2001 SE still has a low score, but 791 is pretty decent for this setup. In CPU-Z Vintage Edition, we saw a huge gain with the CPU speed skating past the reference 1GHz Eden. Flooding point is almost getting there too. A 70% increase gives this Eden a bit more of a fighting chance in some CPU-bound tasks. Now one feature of this setup was DOS. I wanted to run the standard DOS bench suite. I enabled write combining and the 8.5 multiplier. We got some really big gains. The most notable for me was the 480p Quake score. Yes, it makes far more sense to use a GL Quake accelerated version of this in Windows, but a 50% uplift is impressive here thanks to the CPU overclock. Top bench didn't seem to change too much, but speed sys did. 77% on the CPU and 228 on the Visa memory bandwidth. These speeds are handy as it gives us a wide amount of room to work with in newer and older DOS games. We also have excellent control over the speed of the VIA to run some of the older slower games. With this CPU, we have the ability to downclock to the four times multiplier, Enable throttling, turn off cache, and CPU features using the CPU SPD program. In this example, I've set the multiplier to 4, disabled all caches except for decache, and disabled branch prediction. I've also set the throttle to 10. As of version 2.0a of CPU speed, I couldn't get any control out of decache, unfortunately. I have reported this bug to the developer, and if there's any update, I'll revisit this in a follow-up. But with this configuration in place, I'm actually able to run Test Drive 3. it's running decently. It probably does need a bit more tuning, 
The VIA API-ML Mini ITX board is an interesting and flexible retro part. It is low power, completely silent, and the total system power draw never exceeded 35 watts during my entire testing. This was measured from the wall and even when fully overclocked and pushed. No fans are required and it can play a variety of newer and older DOS games. On top of this you can do 2D and some early Direct 3D and OpenGL Windows 98 games too. There are some limits of course. The integrated CPU is close to Pentium 2 era in performance and roughly Super Socket 7 era for the FPU. So targeting even Pentium 2 era games might result in some low performance numbers. The Unichrome IGP is very weak. It lacks hardware TNL and is heavily restricted by memory bus and bandwidth. Expansion is also limited. You've only got the one PCI slot unless you're using a riser or a splitter and some sort of alternative case. I wouldn't recommend going out to get one of these sorts of boards as your main retro gaming driver. But if you happen to stumble across one at a cheap price, or find one somewhere, you can have a bit of retro fun with them and you can provide a very cheap and simple entry point for retro gaming. Oh, and for a bonus bit of trivia here, the game you're seeing on the screen, Formula One, was developed by a company called Bizarre Creations. They were famous for games like Project Gotham Racing on the Xbox, and two games I would consider to be in my absolute pile of favourites, Geometry Wars and The Amazing Racer Blur. Anyway, that wraps up this little project. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around. I've linked a few of my other videos on Mini ITX and the VIA C3 Unichrome IGP down below. Feel free to reach out in the comments with any feedback, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks and bye for now.